It's alive. And we're live. Oh. Hi. It is Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021, 5 o'clock p.m. I am drinking uh, hot buttered rum, which always uh, makes me think of Kate because one time I uh, took Kate, uh, who showed up at Brookings one day, and I took her uh, I across the street to the hotel where uh, that Russian uh, uh, dissident Person beat himself to death, which has a wonderful bar in the Hell basement, that. in the ground floor, where the DuPont Circle Hotel, Hotel DuPont, where... They serve hot buttered rum, and we sat there and drank hot buttered rum. It was so good for uh, mm. for a good long time, which of course catches up with you pretty quickly. Mm. And then Tammy <laughs> showed up, and she wouldn't drink hot buttered rum. Yeah, she was um, like, "What are you doing?" She's like, "You guys are nuts." <laughs> um, and um, uh, that was relatively shortly before pandemic. I mean, it was yeah. probably like October mm. of nineteen or something. Wow. Yeah. Um, so mm. I want to say. Um, hot buttered rum, Aww. but also I want to also uh, uh, um, announce that uh, uh, I did negotiate a time for the Jewish Space Laser Excellent. to come on the show. Uh, the Jewish Space Laser, Laser informs me, I don't know what pronouns to use for the Space Laser, but he, she, or it, whatever, it. yeah. We'll be here Friday evening, and apparently that is not a problem for the Jewish Space Laser because, uh, as an inanimate object, I, you did point out, you did it is point not out. it is not covered by Jewish law. So, it's um, not an Orthodox Jewish Space Laser. Well, apparently it is, but it's just like you know the law covers human activity. Does it have like a Shabbos boy to flip the laser switch if it, it needs says to it? It says it's got it's on a Shabbos clock, which is what <laughs> non-Jews call a timer. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so I, uh, you know, it'll be here. I have no idea. I, I imagine that its voice kind of sounds like Mel Brooks in, in the 2013 year old man, but I have, you know, I don't really know what we're expecting. Um, I'm a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like, well, you might be incinerated. Um, I know, so, exactly. So yeah, we got to be nice to it because, you know, pew, pew, pew and all that. But um, uh, uh, so just, um, you know, come up with your questions for the Jewish space laser. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that'll be Friday. Um, I don't know. Meanwhile, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been removed from all of her committees. Uh, I do think this is a weird uh, punishment for her because this is like saying you get to be uh, a member of Congress with all the prestige and, and none of the, none of the work, work. Right. Yeah. Um, That's what she uh, wants. which seems like what she wants. But we are not allowed to have fun anymore. Apparently, that is not true of Marjorie Taylor Greene, who seems no, to be having a shitload loaded, of fun. Because she's not allowed to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, So I figured it was time for Shane to come back. We're so um, glad you're here. Oh, so Hi, Shane. Here. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Ben. Hello, Kate. Hello, everyone. I started watching The Dissident and, uh, sorry, not to dive straight into it, but the last time that we were uh, interacting over Twitter, uh -huh. I had you had, I had been uh, surfing mm -hmm. the internet and, you're, and you all of a sudden your face was popped up in the trailer uh -huh. that yeah. was circulating for me. And I was like, oh, Shane. And so I watched the trailer and then I read all about it. And then I was like, oh, I have to like pre-order this. And so I pre-ordered it and then it finally came. And then I was too depressed to watch it. <laughs> it won't cheer you up, trust me. I know. And I've tried, I've, like, I've started it like a few times and I've just been like, no, not ready for all of this yet. It's one of the, it's like one of the most startlingly depressing tales. I don't mean to jump right in. We should, Ben, I do this yeah. all the time and then Ben yells at me. But No, 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 no. Me, but, but we should uh, introduce Shane because it's been oh, a yeah. while People since he's know. been Sorry. on the show. <laughs> and not everybody, although I think the predominant way people get to know this show is through rational security. Uh, it is not 100% true that the overlap, by the way, y'all should live, those of you who don't listen to yeah, Rational Security, you? if you on. like this show, you would like Rational Security. Um, 
Uh, but Shane is in the intelligence and intelligence reporter for the Washington Post. Back when we started Rational Security, which like tracks Shane's employment history, he mm -hmm. uh, the earliest episode were like I'm Shane Harris of the Daily Beast, and mm -hmm. then it was I'm Shane Harris of the Wall Street Journal, and now it's Shane Harris of the Washington Post, but he has always covered the intelligence community so at cool. all times. Yeah. And um, he is also the author of The Watchers, as well as um, uh, At War, um, uh, two books uh, that will be of interest to people who uh, like great stories about cybersecurity and spying on people. Um, uh, so, um, Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Big, big fan. Happy to be back. So where do we start? Um, well, I guess we should start with like, how, how, what are the surprises, if any, of the early days of the Biden administration in the intelligence world? Yeah. Got Avril Haines confirmed yeah. real fast. Um, nobody else, right? No, no one else. Bill Burns will probably be sometime later this month for CIA director. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the reactions like uh, and surprises mercifully few. Like, go figure. Like, the the president has appointed like competent people with actual credentials to do something you know significant like running the intelligence community. Um, I thought it was interesting that Avril Haines got rolled out first in that first big announcement of nominees and also that she was confirmed first and the president doesn't seem to be in any great rush to uh you know confirm the cia director oh should i wear my headphones by the way am i echoing no you're, you're not fine. for me actually okay. you're totally you're fine, fine. Okay. um uh but yeah it's sort of like it kind of just created this impression that in the biden administration like he wants the DNI to be the top dog and he wants cia to just do what cia does which if you're like a CIA operations officer, great. Like we're going to get back to spying. And there's a real sense, I think, within that community that they haven't, that they've been distracted for the past 20, not distracted, but they've spent the past 20 years basically going after terrorists. And there's a real desire to get back to the work of classic espionage, which was <clears throat> the previous director's hope, but I'm not sure it was ever really fully realized because, you know, they were spending most of their time battling the president. Um, so, you know, you have a competent, qualified person in Abril Haynes. She appears to be the one who's going to be kind of in charge, um, getting settled in by all accounts. Um, I think there's a lot of like internal morale damage and repair to do there. And, you know, CIA kind of has some sort of repair, I think, that it needs to do internally as well. There's a lot of former officers who are way more outspoken about politics and the agency in the past four years than you ever see from people in that world. And it has in part prompted a bit of a backlash within the CIA as well that Bill Burns will have to inherit, I think. What do you mean backlash within, backlash against people who have been so outspoken or backlash? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. And so is you, you see that you see this kind of closing back down. It's not as if like the last four years were setting some type of new precedent of set speaking to the press or like kind of people speaking out against these types of things. I don't know that it will close. It might, it might <clears throat> inspire people to speak up more. I mean, the people who are the most outspoken were no longer in the agency or who had just left. I mean, so like, you know, one person who's been on your show is Mark Polymeropoulos is a good example of this, right? So Mark was was the uh, what's called the cops you know the chief of operations in russia or for russia <clears throat> and career guy i mean obviously had you know left before he wanted to given his his illnesses which you know you guys have talked about with him on the show but somebody who became very outspoken and became like super online <laughs> like for like to say like you know somebody with his credentials to be very online is really unusual like uh, not not just unusual but like kind of I think of. it's I think it's kind of unheard of. I mean, I, with yeah. you know, you've got the John Cyphers of the world who is in that same category. Is yeah. in the same category, but roughly in the same time frame. Um, oh, yeah. I'm trying to think of who's a John Cipher like person from before. You know, somebody who was sort of 
uh, operational, and then but never people. went to leadership, right? Yeah, so like, like the leadership like people, somebody like Robert Grenier, who was the Pakistan station chief mm. on 9/11, uh, and was actually just on NPR the other day talking about the parallels between insurgencies and what we saw happen at the Capitol. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are people who are in that world who become, you know more like talking heads or ex- yeah coffer black yeah coffer black I and mean, he has his own controversial history but you hadn't seen people who came out and said basically i was there i was there recently and what donald trump is doing is completely fucked up and there are problems with the agency and gina haspel needs to do a better job standing up to him and this is all things they were saying and internally you know there is some real angst about that and it spilled into public view in a week or so ago uh, with a great scoop that the New York Times had, my friend Julian Barnes over there, about this email that the director of counterintelligence for the agency sent out, um, apparently addressed to people who were retirees and therefore earning a pension, which is an interesting little context, saying basically, you know, watch it on social media. Like, you know, not so much saying you don't have a First Amendment right to speak, but in the agency's way of saying, you know, be careful that you're not revealing anything or saying to say anything sensitive that would- and they're gonna like cut their pension? Well, I mean, you know, they could, if they violated their security clearance, they could do worse. The context of the warning came across, or of the reminder, let's say, came across to people who received it as a threat, or as the agency sort of kicking back at them. And there was a separate issue raised in that mm. email about uh, uh, former officers who go to work for foreign governments, which is another way of saying like contractors, right? Who, you know, there's a lot of people who go to work for contractors that help train the Saudi intelligence service or did. Or the UAE. Or the UAE, that's the, that's the bigger one. Yeah. And I think a lot of officers look at this and say like, what the hell? I mean, like we're not, we're not, <clears throat> you know, uh, breaking our oath. Everything is cleared through you guys. Um, you know, why are you coming down on us now? And, no, there's, there's just there's 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 this angst that is going on. Um, there is a and kind look, of it's, it's kind argument. of driven from the top. I'm, oh, I yeah, mean, totally you from know, the you know the Mike Morels and um and uh um uh you know uh uh John uh um Brennan Brennan and uh you know and. I mean, the senior CIA leadership from the last 10 years Mm -hmm. has been incredibly outspoken. And I think mostly that is a good thing because somebody needed to speak on behalf of the intelligence community and it wasn't going to be Rick Grinnell or Gina Haspel, right? Or And Gina Haspel is a more complicated case than Rick Grinnell. But, you know, the John Ratcliffe's of the world. Can, and you, G- can you update me on who Gina Haskell is? She was the, uh, the recent the CIA director. Oh, okay. She, she was There's the CIA director. You know, that, you, that she doesn't ring a bell because she right, she never spoke a word in public. Okay, She see? has tried very hard to not be known. Well, I did meet her twice, like you. and those stories are hilarious. But anyway. That's fascinating. Yeah. She is, yeah. you know, and... and Look, and Haspel was the good one. Haspel was the one who put her head down and did her job. Um, you know, whatever people think of her, she wasn't out there running point for Trump uh, like John Ratcliffe was or like Rick Grinnell was. And so, you know, in the face of that, for um, General Hayden and for you know, for, uh, and in the face of what Pompeo was doing, for people like Hayden and Morell and McLaughlin and Brennan to say, you know, basically pick up a megaphone and shout into it for four years, this is not normal, this yeah. is not healthy, <laughs> right? Like, I basically am very supportive of that. But I think but I do was not. Well, but it's, you know, it's not their job as formers in that environment to be like, like to play nice with Gina Haspel. Um, And I feel for her because I think she was actually trying to hold the fort together. Um, But I also don't think their job is to make her life easy. And um, and so I I generally feel have a lot of sympathy with the with what they've done the question is now that we're back in normal times does that become a sort of persistent state of affairs or 
does does that kind of do we kind of regress to a mean in which former intelligence officers are you know not out there giving interviews on a on a weekly or daily or hourly basis well i mean to some degree they've been bitten by the bug right they, and, and it's a it's a it's a quite a thing after you've spent your career in some cases undercover to suddenly be liberated and to be able to go speak to millions of people at it's once. it's way more fun <laughs> But yeah, it's way more fun to talk about the pendulum shift that that involves. So I suspect that many of them will want to keep doing that. Some of them have contracts with television networks to keep doing it. Um, but I think that the the, 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 the the principal character and the motivation that was causing them to do this is, at least for the moment, off the stage, which is Donald Trump, right? <clears throat> you know, well, they when he was president, they felt the need to speak out because they viewed the president as a national security threat. I mean, they saw the Trump presidency as a national emergency. <clears throat> so when that fuel is kind of taken out of it, I presume they'll be quieter. Uh, most people I talk to are thrilled that Bill Burns is going to be the director. They think it's a great choice. Uh, we'll see. I mean, you know, this is early days, obviously. <clears throat> but like they won't stop talking. But the reason for them to be so outspoken has diminished significantly. And and. Candidly, the reason for journalists to be quoting them all the time is right. significantly, uh, you know, I mean, this is not I mean, I've told people this before, but I feel like the last four years I wasn't covering the workings of the intelligence community. I was covering a president at war with his intelligence community. And that's completely abnormal. I mean, that's unique. That's and not something that I think I'm certainly eager to repeat. Uh, and nor was it a good situation. But so we're just getting back now to like what the normal business of, you know, espionage is, which also is not a normal business. And it's why I love writing about it. So I'm at, can I, if I, I want to ask about that a little bit, which is kind of like, you've had this period in which there has been all of this chatter, all of these people that are kind of going outside with their normal bounds of what they're going to talk about is. And you said that like, there's, um, I don't know. It is interesting that like people like I'm, I'm curious if you work in this area, you must have a sense all the time that there's some type of urgent information that you should communicate to the world or is being kept from the world and that you have some duty. Like what was it about Trump that pushed people over that line? I mean, yeah. they have to walk that they squash things that matter all the time things that are happening in block, black sites, things that happen like with like we can't even imagine like right. ways that they've like, like they've like subverted terrorist attacks. Like that there's never any, that just never gets made public or, yeah. you know? And so like <clears throat> it says something that that happened in the last four years. I, <clears throat> I love this question because it is at the heart of like the big story that I want to write about the past four years and that I'm, writing more in fiction these days, actually, but... Um, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. The, if you go back to 2015, when, you know, Donald Trump had come down the golden escalator, and, you know, there's that great clip of... Um, it's Maggie Haberman and some other people, like, on CNN, and somebody I said, I can't remember who said it, but somebody warned... Uh, that, you know, like you laugh now, but I think there's a good chance that Donald Trump could be the Republican nominee. And everyone is just literally laughing. They're busting out laughing for me. This is so ridiculous. The people who took him seriously as a candidate and who saw him as a potential threat were national security people. In fact, if you go back, the first op-ed that I've been able to identify by a prominent former national security official calling Trump out and saying, no, 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 this is serious. Pay attention to this. And as far as I can tell, was the first maybe official doing that was in lawfare. Yes, um, it, it was John Bellinger. John Bellinger. Yes. And the second was me. <clears throat> right, right. So um, I've been, to me... But now I'm not an official. Right, that's true. But, but that is definitely true. I think uh, you're very good, Ben. <laughs> but, no, but, but, but actually <laughs> that point, that point is... <laughs> Excuse me. That point is really significant. They saw it early. They, they saw, saw it earlier than anyone else. else. I think it was two things. I think one, it was if this happened, it would be disastrous for all the following reasons, right? And there are all the reasons that we know now. And they're right. He's, he's an authority. He has authoritarian tendencies. And it had nothing to do, by the way, with his inexperience. Like that wasn't the issue. It was his authoritarian tendencies. It was his overt you know, uh, uh, fondness for Russia and, and authoritarian regimes as, as time went on, you know, it was only when he talked about Russia, if you're listening. 
So all this stuff sent up the flags. And I think what people saw in him was like, this guy is a walking counterintelligence threat. Are you kidding? I mean, there's, this is a disaster if he's elected. And I, although unspoken, I think they looked at the American public and went, yeah, I could see the American public electing this. I think there was oh, another... Completely. I think that was another big factor, too. Um, it was big for me, and I think I'm pretty confident in speaking for Bellinger on this, um, that it was big for him. That if you're somebody who spent, you know, the Bush years and the Obama years arguing with the left that, hey, this is not all you know, anti-Muslim bigotry, there's a really serious set of problems here that we got to use the powers of the U.S. federal government to address. And you took a lot of incoming uh, as a result of that. There is something super galling, and I think this is partly what's animated Mike Hayden, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there is something super galling about having done that and then having somebody come along and say, no, no, I just want to torture them. I want to kill their families. Right. Uh, I, I actually just hate Islam because I think the problem is, is Muslims. Right. right. And there's a, like, after you've been saying like for years, this is not what this is about to have someone just come along and yank the rug out from under you and say, uh, yeah, it's not really about anything other than bigotry. Uh, and, you know, Islam's out to get us. And so we should get them first, mm -hmm. which is really what the Trump campaign was saying and yeah. what Trump himself was saying. Mm -hmm. And I think the the people in the intelligence world who were most offended by that were the people who had actually like had hard choices to make and made hard and taken heat for, yeah. you know, hard decisions and had to like, you know, go talk to Muslim American audiences about the decisions that they'd made and were really earnest about it. Yeah. And, hmm. you know, and then you have, um, have this Yahoo saying basically you're you were lying and i'm mm. telling the truth and it's really all about just blowing the, them up and that's you know there's something so offensive about that and <laughs> but it also I, gives traction with people because like and the, having people cheer is lie they're in the business of lying and they are in the business of blowing people up right mm -hmm. looked at it and he was like these are the guys who fucked up iraq yeah. Like, yeah. And why should we listen to them? Right. And so all of his deep state kind of mythology, like when he started talking about those officials, like, you know, like, you know, I don't know if you call it a deep state, but it was clear what he was describing. I was like, I know these people. These are my sources. They're the people I've covered for 15 years at the time. And of course, you can pick them up. And like, we already mythologize these people and totally distort their reality and fiction in the movies all the time. But there is a sinister veil to much of what they do. Of course there is. I'm not saying they are sinister, but that's how it's cast. He took total advantage of that. And, you know, and, and it, it makes it very hard for then, you know, your average person uh, to, to see a John Brennan or a Mike Caden as a credible defender of this world when it's like, well, but you guys did torture people. And like, you, know, you do go in these terrible places and like, talk about how there's always someone trying to kill us. I mean, like, he's the one who's out there just calling it like it is. And so you can see how suddenly Donald Trump becomes like, like, well, he has a point. Right, but look at it from Bellinger's point of view. Bellinger was the guy who, A, fought internally to shut down the CIA uh, program and actually mostly succeeded, but didn't entirely succeed right. at it. Right. Right. Um, he's also the guy who had to go talk about in the middle of the, throughout the Bush administration, go to Geneva and present to the Human Rights Council on the U.S. record, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, you know, um, you know, he's really somebody who's personally out there. Yeah. 
And then to have Donald Trump come along and say, basically everything you said to the, the Human Rights Council and to all the human rights groups, it was all bullshit. Right. Yeah, I'm going to kill their families and I'm going to torture them and we're going to do things way worse than waterboarding. And like that is a, um, that is a remarkable moment for a lot of people. And I think it's not an accident that that community saw right through it because yeah. he was he was basically saying they'd all been lying for 15 years yeah he, and i think that to the point too of them understanding that this would be appealing to a lot of americans you know they knew that and now the people we'd understand are trump supporters didn't want to apologize for those things that happened right right i mean they did i mean they might not say like well i think we should torture people but they might agree like you know well what do i care those guys planned 9 11. yeah Fuck them. They had Whatever happens to them. Cry it out of them. It'll help, you know? And, this, and, 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 you know, you remember, like, when Obama came in and, you know, and conservatives were like, oh, here we go with the apology tour, right? And so it becomes defined as this having to, you know, explain away the things that we did to protect ourselves, that we were told were the right things to do. And Trump comes in and says, you shouldn't have to apologize for this. And frankly, I want to crank it up to 11. And people go, hell yeah. Right. And it's, and, it, and it's kind mm. of stunning for people then to hear like people who participated like on the front lines of the war on terror. Right. I mean, like people in the rooms when the drones were flying and people who were at forward operating bases in Pakistan or on, or on the border with Pakistan coming out and saying like, no, what Donald Trump is telling you that like, that's that's not right. You know, we do these things under law and we have limits on this stuff. Um, yeah, you know, it's. I think that if if people who were not in the business of apologizing for America, right, were also offended and frightened by what Donald Trump was saying, that gives you a measure of just the shock that he sent through the intelligence system. I just so Janine has Hi, a Jeanine. question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. Oh, I just wanted to say that what a tremendous explanation conversation that just was. I just feel like I learned so much about kind of like thinking about what what the intelligence community has gone through in the last four years and how they've kind of like, I don't know how they're going to come out of it now. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, Janine. Yeah. Hi. So, so Janine, Janine has a very on point question to this. All right. Um, so first of all, hi, Shane, a uh, big fan of rational security. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, and my question is, do you think that the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, national security professionals were the first to see Trump as a legitimate threat is because national security people are more inclined to take the worst case scenario seriously? I think that's a big part of it. And because they had seen authoritarians in other regimes, right? They worked in parts of the world where they're used to this style of leader, um, whether it be, you know, I mean, it's not region specific, they're all over the world. So I think that they recognize the strains and said, like, well, Donald Trump may look unusual in the American political tradition and the kind of world political tradition. Oh, he's quite familiar. And, and their minds do. You're absolutely right. And you kind of go to this like scenario of like what's like. You know the the high impact low probability scenario and like donald trump was a high impact like medium probability scenario like yeah he might get elected uh they didn't dismiss out of hand i think that he could uh, uh that he could win but they spotted him early for those reasons I think. can i can i ask what um i was I, I want to go back to the kind of this like oh like this like this 2008 like oh here comes the apology tour kind of like uh around yeah. obama um, after all this and like how you think that part of Trump's thing was that that wasn't going to happen. I, I actually think that's even more prophetic than just to, to the intelligence community. The man hasn't apologized for anything ever in his life, it seems like. Ever. And it seems to be this level of like lack of apology that really does resonate with like this, like kicking ass and taking names and like whatever mm -hmm. else kind of American ethos. I do think it's American to a certain, I mean, maybe it's not, maybe it's everywhere. And I'm like, maybe there's factions like that in every place. There probably are. But there is certainly like a very vocal kind of um, trope of Americans being, uh, uh, of that ilk kind of being in that, in that frame. And so like, I think that there's, 
here is something that's always struck me, and I'm curious to see what you both think of this, which is that that type of like lack of being able to apologize, like the lack of like saying I'm sorry in any context, was like this remarkable, simp- simplistic, and consistent message that was so easy for a lot of people to understand. Yeah. It doesn't matter the details on literally anything from grabbing her by the pussy to like, to like, you know, bombing around to like doing whatever else you're going to do. Like the message is always the same. You don't apologize yeah. and you don't back down. And there's just something, I mean, I'm not saying anything hugely new here. We've talked about this for four years, but some like, I don't know, like just this conversation is bringing up that this is like more than just an intelligence moment right. for, um, you know, for, for what he kind of meant and what this presidency was. I, and I think it's what he learned from Roy Cohn. I mean, yes. in, in, that, in that it's like, I mean, Donald Trump is, is interesting to me for so many reasons. One of them is that um, he believes his own act. You yeah. know, it's one thing to never apologize publicly, right? And to like, you know, never let your guard always be hitting back, you always be fighting, which is what Roy Cohn, you know, expressly taught him. But we imagine characters like that, I think, are often like in the privacy of their own room or like, you know, maybe they're racked with guilt or anxiety or they're second guessing. There's just no indication that that's the case with him. And this is one of the most reported on and covered men yeah. of the past 50, 60, 70 years. And I'm, the least secretive of it. in some ways. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's like amazing that like and I like I think like that the. the the latest instantiation of this is like I think he's talked himself into the fact that the election was stolen. Yes, I I definitely think oh, I he's completely that like, was talked into it. like I have to say I this now. It's like oh no, it was stolen. His own bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, his own bullshit. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All I right. Think it started so, off as like a, sh- it, but I think that's just. Ent- I think that's all of it. Like, all I also time. do think though all that like it. way down in a place that he can't access the animating core of Donald Trump is fear. And I think it's fear of failure. I think that there is a molten hot core of anxiety that is like wrapped in lead that he will not let, let break through. But if it ever oh, did, I love that psychological. I love that psychological read. I think that that's probably that. I think that that's deeply relevant. Not that I want to talk about his daddy issues or whatever, right, right, but there's right, but definitely like. like the but I think that it. there's, yeah, there's yeah. there's something going on. Ben, do you okay. want to ask Sh- Shane something? Well, so I have submitted, I just, to those who have not yet answered the poll, I have submitted to the audience the question of whether I should ask Shane about the aliens. Um, uh, I will respect the audience's uh, decision on this. I think Um, they know what they're going to (laughs) say. But, uh, so in the meantime, while the audience is deciding this question. like, Like aliens and not like the term that we use for people who are not. From no. This country. No. Oh, I, I, he's talking about little green men and that totally. shit. Um, oh, nice. The ones are fine too. Nice. Anya oh, Scheiss, so uh, the floor is yours, but I can't, your, your camera is off, so uh, you will be a disembodied voice. Huh. Sorry about that. Not quite sure why that would be the case, but. Um, the aliens have intervened, apparently. <laughs> yes, clearly, clearly. Um, so, Shane, my question is just very broad, which is. Um, dealing with a competent versus an incompetent administration, or maybe said differently, professional versus less professional, um, how is your job different? And is it actually easier under an administration like Trump's because there are so many people that are willing to talk about what's going on just because of you know frustration or whatever else? Right, well, it, it, it's a great question. And, and we have a comparison because like before Trump, you know, for the, 16 years I've been a reporter. That was all the normal, competent kind of model, right? And so Trump is the aberration. Um, it is, on the one hand, it is easier to deal with the normal people because like you can, like just today, I sent a rather complex question to the State Department and there are three people working on it to get me an answer and try to set up some kind of interview for me eventually. And it's like, great. And like, they take you seriously and it's respectful and it's like, it's great. Like that part is like, you can ask a question, you can get an answer and you can, you know, hopefully put that into an article that will be very fulfilling to people. Um, on the other hand, it's much easier to deal with an administration like Trump. Yes, where everyone was stabbing each other in the back. Palace intrigue was the order of the day, every day. Um, the leaks were unbelievable. 
I mean, including leaks, you know, that, you know, we've talked about this before on like rational security. I'm sure you guys have here too. In the early parts of the administration, things that leaked out where you're going like, geez, I mean that I, you know, the Michael Flynn conversation with Kislyak kind of is the key example of where you're like, holy shit. You know, somebody just, you know, read out an intercept of a U.S. person. Wow. And it's like, what, February? I mean, or was it before that? It was December. Um, uh, So in that sense, sure, as a reporter, I mean, when people are just handing stuff out all the time, um, that's easier as a reporter. But that also then means that the stories that you're producing have very little to do with policy. They have everything to do with the internal drama of like what's going on at court. And again, to my point of like, I felt like I was covering an intelligence community at war with the president. I mean, I can't really point to a great story I wrote on like how the CIA is combating a rising China, even though the past four years, that's been a gigantic problem, right? We're distracted by all these other things. And and those are important stories and they're of the moment too. But, you know, it's not the reason that most of us who got into national security reporting, you know, keep doing it. You know, we, we do want to write about more about substance and less about personality. Speaking of substance... It's Tony Kava, now Gandalf the Rat. <laughs> Hello, Tony. Yes. Hello. I'm I like that relaxed um, position. Oh. Uh, oh, have you? Yes. Hello. Oh, I'm on the so West nice Coast, and I'm supposed to be working, so nice. but there's something more interesting to do than my job. So what do I do? I'll just rub my belly and ask Shane a question. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> hey, I, thank you. I'm a big fan, Shane, a big fan of your work, uh, your you. writing and everything. But I, you're welcome. Uh, but I have a couple palate cleansing questions. Sure. Um, the, if I could ask a couple of them. The first is... Yeah, um, go for it. Basically, oh, thank you. Um, the first is, I'm wondering, how do you prefer your science fiction physics? Do you like it sciency, like The Expanse, or whatever? We measure speed in units of distance without the factor of time, like Star Wars. Uh-huh. I like it more like the former, like, Interstellar. Um, is yeah. like, I, I like, I mean, I, like, one of the things that I love about Interstellar, in addition to I love the Nolan Brothers movies in general, but I love that they yeah. were so committed to trying to get the physics correct. And, you know, not that you read uh, Seven you know, Eves? Uh, no, I have not. I should read that. Um, Sorry, I didn't read that. That's like, what I, the Expanse I, is like. Well, I, this yes. is a, that's a show that's on my list too. So thank you for my action. That means oh, I should amazing. push it up to top top. But I feel like this way about yeah. spy fiction too. Like you don't have to get the technical details right, but I find it so much more satisfying if you do or if you try. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I just think it helps the expanse it's more realistic. It's more human experience. Yeah. Yeah, the expanse is really interesting because there's no light speed travel, and if you're going to go intercept someone, you've got a plot like parabolic orbits nice figure right. it all out you just yeah. gotta appear like that. right right so i've got another question that's specific to star wars okay um if i may um yeah. and i just want to look at this again because i'm so nervous i can't remember my question um and developed a german accent <laughs> no, <I know>. nah. <laughs> what, what happened to palermo I'm wondering... <laughs> to palermo yeah that's right yeah yeah I can't even think of an Italian accent right now. I'm so nervous. Um, my question is, um, how would you rank the Star Wars droids? Mm-hmm. And assuming you consider K2SO a Star Wars droid, mm-hmm. where does he rank? And finally, if you were if you were a Star Wars droid, which Star Wars droid would you oh, be? That's a tough question. And I have a theory of that also. Oh, really? OK, well, I'm going to ask you what you think my droid would be. Yeah. Um, so I think my favorite, I do think my favorite Star Wars droid is C-3PO. Um, as much as he was like a total like prig and, you know, and like always kind of like the name <laughs> there. I just, I mean, as, as a kid, I was just, I was also just captivated by him and the accent and like mm-hmm. Anthony Daniels and all of that was great. And R2-D2 was kind of like the little scamp troublemaker. Like, I know he's supposed to be the cute one everyone loves. I was much more like the type A C three PO character, <laughs> um, and then I like what's the what's the droid that they brought back in the Mandalorian? The, that's the assassin. Oh, that BB. Um... Oh, the one that Taika Waititi played. Yeah, Taika Waititi. Rotating... Yeah, exactly. So I had that action figure yeah. as a kid, and when they brought him into the oh, Mandalorian really? universe, I was just like, 
what? I and mean, it was like, that was like a moment of like friends and I kind of were just like, this is going to be great. And I wish they had done more with him. But like, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there are any of the other like droids I'm overlooking. I mean, it's just I, yeah. I just I'm a I'm a C3PO guy, and like in the in the final movie, and I yeah. liked I, I liked Chapter Nine, Episode Nine. I don't care what anybody says, I liked it very much. Mm-hmm. But like the moment where he's kind of like powering down, I was like, Maybe. <laughs> so, which, <laughs> you think so I, what was I, the theory, Tony? The theory of which droid Shane is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, my favorite Star Wars movie it is Rogue One, actually. Oh, so good. Rogue One's amazing, yeah. and I think that uh, Shane is more of a K2SO figure. Okay. Yeah, he's sassy, and he's kind of opinionated, like and he can be a pain in the butt when he wants to be and needs to be. I didn't like that. So yeah, K2SO is shit, too. I mean, he looked, he looked awesome. He did oh, yeah. sassy-ass demeanor, too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I've always had a problem. You know what? Security. You're making me rethink this now. So I've always had a problem yeah, with K2 all the SM, Star Wars man. droids myself, because if you have the technology to build all of these droids, um, presumably you have the technology to consolidate them and to make you know one droid that can do all the shit that r2d2 can do on a ship can do all the translations that c3po and also can walk with a normal gait um which uh you know like 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 we have the technology boston you know uh whatever it's called and you know that releases all those cool but robot it was a videos long time boston dynamics I, I boston dynamics you know like they make droids that walk better than the ones in in Star Wars. So I just think the Star Wars droids are all like fucked up. And um and I'm I I am much I think the much cooler droids are the ones in the alien universe. Um which right. are basically just artificial humans. Oh right, right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think you should check out those are replicants actually. But no that's Blade Runner. But yeah, you yes, should later. check out K2SO. And also, I don't know the name of that Taika Waititi robot, it's but he moves pretty awesome. Thing. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Alice I'm Mercer. Like back with it's all IG-11. Now. Sorry. I, have all, like, I have all of these science fiction books that I have to talk to you about at some point. Yeah, but now we can only see the top of your head, Kate. I know, but then there's and then there's all of the like this is all my graphic novels, anyways. We're su- I'm like back in my super nerd land. I love it. Uh, yeah. Hi, Alex. But no cormorants. No cormorants. Thanks, Ben. Rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ben, I want to thank you for going over and saying that you'll always take a question from Alice without specifying which one of us. You know. And that's part- I, I I love pleasing multiple people at a time. You know, yeah, it's Alex. like uh, I can I can if I can throw out a a compliment that eight different people can think is directed at them. He's he's kind of promiscuous like that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But Alice L. always does ask really great questions. She, so. As do you. So do you. And L and M are next to each other in the alphabet. <laughs> and so you, you are go. like very similar in, in, in nomenclature respects. Her questions are more very specific because of her area. Like yesterday's, I would never ask a question. Instead, I'm an elementary teacher. Mine's more general, which is what is the weirdest at the most off the rails story that you ran across in the last few years. <laughs> oh man, oh, <laughs> that's I a great question. Know. Can you tell us something that you didn't report that you uh, didn't report or like substantiate, but like um, it was just seemed interesting? Gosh, I'm trying to think. I mean, if it's Trump specific, there are just so many. And then I'm trying to think of like which ones I can't talk about because we didn't prove it or because it was somebody else's story that I heard. Um, God, what was the most off the wall? I still think, well, the first thing that just popped into my mind, and I'd run a really think about to rank order them, is the whole Putin told me story, Putin told me story. That one is just, I mean, it, it kind of fits a theme, so it's not that off the wall, but basically when 
Trump was just going on and on and on about how it was actually Ukraine and not Russia that interfered in the 2016 election. This fits the category, by the way, if he started to believe his own bullshit, right? Because somebody planted the idea in him <clears throat> that like, oh, Ukraine did it, and they have the server in Ukraine, which he asked Zelensky about on the phone call. And Zelensky's like, what are you talking about? Um, and when, like, when he was finally confronted by a senior official who I can't name, um, uh, he said, he said, well, no, I know that Ukraine did it. And he says, why do you think that? He says, oh, Putin told me. And this person was just like, what? And like, he just took it like, yeah, 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 he told me. I know what happened. And like, that's like, like a moment where I think people were like, we've lost him. Like he doesn't just, isn't just skeptical that Russia did this and doesn't want to believe the intelligence community to like keep up the act. Like he believes that Vladimir Putin wouldn't lie to him and told him this. And it's just, it was kind of one of those moments where it's like, he's too far gone. The other thing that comes to mind too is, and a lot of this we were never able to flesh out, but I feel like I can talk about it more now, is like the 25th amendment conversations were more advanced and they happened more than once. Yeah. Are, are you suggesting, Shane, that Rod Rosenstein has not been entirely truthful about this? I am not suggesting it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, but that's like that, that kind of falls into that category of, you know, there were moments, there were many moments, but just taking the 25th Amendment bracket, where people in the administration, really thought, are we going to have to break the glass in case of emergency? And, and it never went to the point that I'm aware of, of anything formal where like they all got together at somebody's house one night and decided to like do the deal. But it went higher and it did go to the level, at least early in the administration of cabinet level. On this last round, I know it was happening at sub cabinet levels and there was like nobody wanted to say they took it to the bosses. But I asked somebody, uh, a political appointee at the time, it was just a couple, only like a month or two ago, I said, it was right after January 6th, and when this all flared up again, and I said, what is the motivation for these cabinet members contemplating doing this? And he kind of like, didn't look at me because we were on the phone, but he looked at me like, what are you kidding? And he's like, well, because he'll get people killed. And we want to avoid that. I mean, it's like, you know, these January 6th shook the hell out of a lot of people. Yeah. And I think that they looked at that and said that they at least had to contemplate the possibility that if he were to go out in public again and exhort people to violence again, that that would be on their heads and to say we could have stopped him and we didn't. Yeah. Christopher Argyris. Hello. Up late hey. again in London. Mm. Always, always up late. I, I, I don't recommend my uh, sleep schedule. Um, he's, a, he's a graduate student. What do you expect? No. <laughs> I'm more than a PhD student. I know. I know. I'm I know. just joking. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, so, Bill Burns, how should we look, look at this nomination? Yeah. Uh, there was obviously a, a lot of people sort of trial ballooned for the for the position, including so David. Many. Yeah. Um, so, should we look at this as okay? Tony Blinken's at state. So we need to. Have, we like Bill Burns. We don't have a position for him. Let's 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 put him at CIA, or is this um, in line with sort of a, a lot of the other like a lot of allied countries, France, uh, the uh, Commonwealth countries that you is there, there's a more of a tradition of putting a senior diplomat and and, and not a, a career uh, CIA person uh, at the helm of, of the spy agency um, and sort of a, a a move away from the sort of Haspel, um, mm. Pompeo, uh, Brennan, sort of this either like the militarization of CIA or this like counterterrorism, co and then giving the leadership to like the career person, like putting a like out and out diplomat. Is, yeah. is this more about sort of restoring old school spot, old school espionage and? liaison relationships yeah or is it or is it more about the singular person of bill burns well i don't think it's necessarily about the singular person of bill burns and you're right to point out that there were many trial balloons floated um and and also there were a lot of combinations i think that were tried to get it right so you know now a little bit of this is maybe even people exaggerating the degree to which they were truly a front runner or somebody or my friends under consideration but 
broad, you know, basically you had like in the beginning, it was either going to be Mike Morrell or Avril Haynes. And, you know, that was a sense that like, oh, so they're going to kind of go down more of the traditional path. Of, like if it's Mike Morrell, people will love that former deputy director, career guy. He was the DDI, which runs the analysis uh, uh, directorate. He'd been an acting director. And then he started running into all kinds of headwinds. And there's another piece of this, which I think is underappreciated, but like if my if my reporting on this is right, I think that Susan Rice was supposed to be Secretary of State. And I think that didn't quite work. And I think Tony mm. was maybe supposed to be National Security Advisor. And I think that Jake Sullivan was supposed to have a domestic role and things started getting scrambled. I think when it may have become clear that Susan Rice was going to have problems getting confirmed, um, not least because she threatened to run against Susan Collins in a primary in Maine. Uh, and you need Susan Collins' vote, or they thought they might when they weren't sure whether they were going to have control of the Senate. And so I think that scrambled things. And if you notice, there was like the big rollout in the beginning of like, here are our top four people, and then things kind of were quiet for a while. I think something happened in the mix and that they were kind of going through these permutations, right? And for a while, like Tom Donilon was on the list. And then there's a question of like, okay, well, Avril's going to DNI, so who does she want to work with? Does she want to work with Tom? Would she rather work with Mike? What about David Cohen? What about this guy? What about that guy? And it just kind of started, all these permutations were going. And I think that's kind of set off because it didn't maybe go as exactly according to plan. I may be reading that, too, that a little bit too much, but I was kind of surprised, to be honest, when Bill Burns came in. There was no question I thought that we should assume that the Biden administration wanted to get back to, as you say, you know, traditional espionage. Gina Haspel had wanted to do that. And there were people advising the Biden transition. And I think Mike Morrell's probably in this category who were urging, like, that's where we got to go. We got to get back to this and kind of more broadly speaking away from counterterrorism or putting that more like on steady state on the back burner. Um, and how I'm still not entirely clear how Burns comes onto the radar and how he finally gets into the mix. Uh, other than like some people, Mike Morrell dropped out, Donilon dropped out. Um, there was a question of whether there needed to be a woman at the agency, I think, because it wasn't clear if there were enough women in, in top positions. Um, but Burns is interesting in that, you know, he, he, there's not really a model at the CIA of a diplomat being the director, right? And in recent years, you've had the director be a career in person from the inside and the deputy be more a political, or you've had the inverse of that. So you had like John Brennan with David Cohen, right? Or you had Mike Pompey with Gina Haspel. Hmm. So they complemented each other. So there was always sort of a career person in the mix at one point. And now you have kind of neither. I mean, David Cohen is the deputy director. Again, he served in that position for two years. Intel's not real. I mean, he did financial intelligence, so I don't want to minimize that. But like, he's not a spook. Um, and nor is Bill Burns. But Bill Burns, interestingly, is kind of like an honorary spook. Because, you know, he's sort of been like in the room for so many, you know, moments of like high crisis and big policy. I mean, the Iran deal being the most obvious example. But like, this is a guy who I think fully understands what the CIA does. And importantly, he understands the role of intelligence to inform policy making. And that sounds kind of like wonky, but what that genuinely means is like the CIA is there to provide answers to people who have to make really hard decisions. And he has been one of those guys who had to make really hard decisions based on the intelligence that was provided to him. And so I think that he appreciates what the CIA is capable of and I'm sure has strong opinions on what his shortcomings are. And like, as far as I can tell within the building, they're like, this is a great choice. Like, this is good, we can deal with this. And in the meantime, David Cohen is sort of running the shop and Phil Burns gets confirmed. But it's definitely like after all of the sort of torture, which no one will remember now, of like how they finally arrived at like, you know, the Goldilocks solution, um, you know, read him as a really seasoned Washington operator who Biden trusts very much. There is nobody in a senior position that Biden doesn't trust. And it's like right. emotion and personality at the end of the day drives this. He's Only, had so much contact oh, with so many people in so, so many, many different capacities. And his book is so, kind of like regarded as like a masterwork on diplomacy. He's just, yeah. you, you could write him in a novel in some ways. Like, you know. Maybe you All right. should. Only on in lieu of fun. 
can you hear Shane deliver himself of that um, uh, learned exposition on the new CIA leadership while the audience is uh, cheerfully yeah. skewering the new background of uh, our next questioner. Uh, Daniel, he is free range. He is not in appropriate clothing for the show. He is not in his big chair, but the floor is yours. So I have a kind of a general overview question is what do you think the unique challenges of fighting domestic terrorism are compared oh. to fighting terrorism from abroad? Oh, what a good question. Yeah, I mean, the first big one is the First Amendment. I mean, <laughs> and I've had a lot of conversations. It's a great so question. True. The question that we first, are First, not the fourth? Well, and then the fourth. After I would put the okay. fourth. <laughs> yeah. um, but you put them in a package. Um, or the Constitution. I mean, just yeah. more broadly. Um, I mean, these are questions that we as reporters have been asking sources kind of furiously for the past, you know, what, almost a month now. Um, and we all keep getting some variation of the same answer, right? Which is like, we don't go after foreign terrorists the way we will have to go over them after domestic extremists and putting aside whether we even call them terrorists or not, um, because they're operating to a large extent within the zone of protected activity. Um, and, and nobody, I should say, you know, and I, you know, you know, I know a lot of those people who blew up a lot of terrorists, none of them are advocating for like, we need to reassess the First Amendment. Like that conversation is not happening and it wouldn't happen in the intelligence community anyway. Yeah, the, so the other huge difference is the National Security Act of 1947, oh, yeah. which says that all Absolutely. of Shane's sources who don't work at the FBI aren't allowed to work on the problem. Correct. Yeah, that's a great point. That's Correct. a really, that's like, I actually would, that's a really, really good point. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up? Um, yeah. well, very, but um, I just wanted to say, or well, maybe not ask, but I wanted to say that the First Amendment, no one's sit, talking about reworking the First Amendment because it has become, well, maybe this is a separate show, but like just such a, such a different kind of conception of what the First Amendment stands for and becomes so rigid in terms of the public and private kind of conceptions of the First Amendment, the powers that are around it, that um, it's just not particularly movable, uh, mm -hmm. absent some big change from SCOTUS. And we know that's not going to be in the cards anytime soon. So, right. yeah. All right. Before we let E.G. Phillips ask his question, though, we've got to get an explanation for his Twitter handle, which for those who do not know, is duck with pants and Wait, so what? i want to know eg phillips duck with pants what gives <clears throat> okay well first of all it's ducks with pants oh, oh. Yeah. Ducks yeah with the pants don't leave out the other ducks. in them and apparently you have not read the, the full bio um ducks with pants is the name of my fake band awesome. um uh, which I am the sole proprietor and a last sole member of. And the origins of this uh, moniker just come down to the fact that I like to play around with words, words that are inherently funny. What happens if you put together words that are inherently funny, that they become exponentially funny? And thus, Ducks with Pants was born. That's Ducks with Pants is funny. It's got a K in it. It's funny. Although I think, I actually, I think it's funnier <laughs> if it's only one duck. That should like work in spades for me. Uh, <laughs> it, it gives you more <laughs> options when you're doing the visuals. If you have the ducks, multiple ducks with the pants, um, you can check out my album artwork if you, if you look me up. I am so um, glad I asked this question. Um, your question, sir. So. Uh, during this transition period after the Capitol insurrection, we got very little information out of law enforcement in the way of um, press conferences and the like. And those that they did, mm -hmm. they went to great pains to make, do rather surreptitiously, as it were, you know, while Trump is giving his victory lap speech at the wall, dropping videos in the middle of the night and then disappearing them. So, not having you know the FBI decapitated during this critical period made some sense. So keep your head down, okay. But it's been two weeks since Trump has been out of office. So what gives? Why have we not heard from Chris Ray yet? I, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer because I think that 
Um, you're right to point out that you can explain it in that period between January 6th and January 20th as keep your head down, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, don't give the president you know, a reason to do something else crazy like fire the FBI director. Um, I would assume that the reason it's not happening now has more to do with the White House controlling the communication strategy, frankly, in a way that it probably didn't have any coherent way of doing in the Trump administration. It really didn't. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know that Chris Ray is going to get out in front of this unless Biden kind of signals that he wants to. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to know for sure. I mean, he could. He could easily go give a speech tomorrow. I, I, I think, Chain, you're being way too generous here. It's inexcusable that we haven't heard from Chris Ray. And, you know, while Trump was in office and he could be fired at any moment, uh, I suppose that is a reasonable trade-off. You say, okay, I've got to lead this agency and I don't want to, it's really more important that we arrest these and conduct a thorough investigation than the public communications are. Right now, for the amount of information to be coming out of the Justice Department about this investigation, other than through indictments and press releases about individual cases, is zero. It's freaking crazy. And it actually makes me... And, and if you compare it to uh, other major investigations of this uh, uh, scope and scale, where they are... There's a daily briefing. Um, there's a, you know, think about it in comparison to, well, I mean, think about how, how available Bob Mueller was, you know, day after day after day, or the, the special agents in charge were during the 9-11 uh, investigation. And, you know, I think it, like it's going to raise questions in a lot of people's minds about the Bureau's... Uh, own unpreparedness for yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it is a show of real weakness for the, for the FBI. I just don't know how to read it any other way. Yeah. All right. Which brings us to the aliens question. Ah. Uh, so, you know, the, there's so many of them. 84.1% of the audience voted for the aliens. That's question. it? Yeah. We, we, but you know, the, you don't, which means you don't have to answer. What? Um, yes? <laughs> so I, I just want to know, Shane, now that we have a new administration. Yes. And um, is there going to be a release of information, including the secret captured alien spaceships? Or is this going to be another regime of cover-ups and... Uh, and you know, hiding hiding the truth from the American people. Well, I think we've earned the truth, don't you? No, oh, sorry. yes. You're drinking mushroom tea. <laughs> I've got some weird sake. We're like, I mean, we are like, there's just, I, I feel, I right? Now's the yeah. time. Now is the time, Mr. President. 80. Tell the truth. Uh, although, know, all jokes aside, there is a provision. I'm not confident it's going to be... <laughs> to reveal much, much less be adhered to uh, in the NDAA, I think, that requires the DNI to produce an unclassified report, basically on like, so what do you know about these unidentified aerial phenomena? Um, which I have to say, kind of with some credit to the military, they're more and more being transparent about it. And it comes down to like, we don't know what the fuck these things are, but we're logging a shitload of them and we don't know what they are. Doesn't Trust the plan, man. Trust the plan. Oh, man, I, now I'm you may want to go watch Independence Day. Oh, that was a good one. It, it no, stars Ted Cruz, day. doesn't it? What's that? That stars Ted Cruz, doesn't it? No, I'm yeah, kidding. He wishes. Oh, I, was like, <laughs> he wishes. I was like, did I miss some, like, oh, is he the like very alien bad that, like, Will Poland. Smith murders in the desert? <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Well, it's <laughs> Earth. He, he gave a speech that was like based oh, on Independence Day. He, like, oh, off. So yeah, he's always crazy. quoting lines from movies and getting it wrong. Yeah. Um, but no, I think <laughs> I put this real quick. I think like best alien movie, like like you know, obviously two thousand one. Like it's, it's, no, okay, it's yeah. Alien. 
alien um that's like that's more in like the monster aliens version yeah i was gonna say there's like different ones but yeah that's pretty good. <laughs> control yourself tear jerker alien movie you're e. frozen e. on my screen yeah. right now <laughs> e. i can't watch et and not cry but honestly like my favorite like search for extraterrestrial life movie and not a people a lot of people like this movie is contact and i like contact oh my gosh, i love contact i, I love, love contact, contact. Yeah. Also, wait what is the movie that's the name of it for some reason i always want to say contact but it's not about contact but it came out a couple of years close ago. encounters of the third kind no no it's the that's one with good. like that's also good ben jesus christ <laughs> i feel like you're like a kid at the kitty table and you're just like <laughs> pay attention to me <laughs> <laughs> i you know wait, no, every wait. time i think about alien i i i do want that that Detached, that, that multi-layered jaw. jaw. It's I. It that's awesome. He named it. It's Arrival. You saw? Did you see Arrival, Shane? Uh, oh, Arrival. Oh God. Oh, no, you just reminded me. That actually. That, that might be act- competing with Contact. That movie. Yeah, no. So that's. I, I, like I was confused by. Like that's what I think was Contact. That's the one with the seven-legged, Correct. heptapod yeah. beast. That was a yeah. good movie. It was a really good language. movie. Yeah, and it was really it's an amazing language. It also has an amazing score. It does um, which, have an amazing yeah. and that crazy house. My mother-in-law yeah. like was like obsessed with that house for many, many months I, after that. that, that movie. We had a helicopter in the yard. Also, yeah. if we're talking about really great alien movies, the original 1954 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, that's good. Is oh, a I've freaking great movie. It's got some weird ass. The Cold War. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 got some weird elements just from being from like the reverence for doctors. Fifty-four um, uh, is like something that would not have persisted long. It is a genuinely scary movie. Are you a Dune fan, Shane? I do like Dune. Um, I, my father read the books and was very into it. We saw the movie when it came out, and I guess I would have been like nine or ten when it came out. Um, and the movie was just trippy as shit. Yeah. And very confusing and a little weird. And I wasn't like really. The book is a little trippy. Yeah. And like, I, I've been meaning to also see the documentary Hodorowsky's Dune about. The I've ju- I just Hodorowsky watched Dune. it. Is it great? It's very good. Yeah. I, I, I liked it a lot. It was really, really good. And I'm, um, John is, my partner is like one of his favorite movies is, or favorite books is Dune in the series. Oh. He loved it. And so like, I got him a first edition for. Um, Christmas, but we're gonna go see the movie. But it looks really good. Doesn't it look like, really very, good? Yeah, is it, it looks really streaming good. Streaming yet, or is it not out? No, I don't okay. think it's out yet. I, I would be, but like, anyways, I'm really looking forward. Is it the same but... director who did Arrival? Yes, it is right. Yes, yeah. so that's why I'm hopeful about it too. It's not a trippy director. And what um, I mean, I'm curious too, like, because like Dune is a very challenging film. And it's kind of like, and you also you look at that movie and you're like, this was edited down a lot, wasn't it? And it's like, yeah. But I wonder yeah. if, like, if, if, if the new one will be a little bit more like palette friendly, because there's just weird shit that's kind of like not totally explained or inferred in Dune. And it's like kind of Kubrick-esque in the 30s, long It's scene. super Kubrick-esque. That's a yeah. great way of putting like, it. Like yeah, it's very yeah. like ethereal. Like there's yeah, a lot, and of, a lot of dialogue in some places. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's very. Um, I and Kyle MacLachlan agree. is weird as shit. It's just great. I love him. Yeah. Oh, this could be. Let's have a sci-fi episode where we just invite our fan, our friends on who are like big sci-fi fans. And we yeah. just like geek out about our favorite shit, Ben. That'd be fun. Uh, I'm not enough of a sci-fi person to participate well, you don't have usefully to in that, but I can host <laughs> it. Um, all right. We are going to... Who's going to be on the show tomorrow, Kate? We have no idea, right? Uh, we have a, a couple of options that I'm going to text you about later, but we uh, no, we don't know yet. All right. So Taylor Swift and uh, Gina Haspel will be on the show tomorrow. Yep. Right. Um, and um, She might uh, call for that. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, that'll be, and then the Jewish Space Laser on Friday. Uh, that'll all start 22 hours and 52 minutes from now. And until then, we don't have fun anymore. But we do get to do intelligence reporting again, rather than reporting on the intelligence community spazzing out and trying to figure out how to not cease to exist. 
Uh, thank you, Shane. You're a great American, and we thank will you. see you soon. It was a delight. Yes. Thank you all.